Welcome back everybody, it's Dr. A from History Surfer. For those of you from my class, this is a um, lecture on Greece. And we're going to begin talking about the impact of Greece on the ancient world. Greece was an important place for Western culture. We've looked at Egypt, we've looked at Mesopotamia. These two places, while they did indeed have an influence on the West, it is certainly the Greek culture that we consider the foundations of Western culture. And if you're not familiar with Greece, it's right here. Uh, to ground you, there's Egypt down there. So this is the top of Africa, that's Italy, Greece, what today would be modern day Turkey. And if you don't know anything about geography, there's your chance to learn. Uh, it's really important to have an idea of where things are and hey wonder if you want to travel you got to know where you want to go so let's start here and we're going to go prior to what's considered the classical period to um, prehistoric Greece if you will uh, but it's not really because they did indeed have writing it's just we don't understand it and we're going to start with the Minoan culture which, uh, as far as scholars can tell, was founded here on the island of Crete, right there. In between Egypt and the mainland Greek culture that would eventually emerge, and also close to Asia Minor, alright? So it's kind of in the center of three really important places. And we're going to start by looking at the Palace of Knossos. Knossos, right here in the middle of Crete, is where we see the center of Minoan culture. And Minoan culture was important to the later development of the Greeks because of the architecture, we believe, and also some motifs that do indeed stick around. We still see them show up in places in Greece and also in Italy. So let's look at Knossos and what it was. Knossos was, again, we believe, the center of the Minoan culture and it was a palace that was built by, most people believe, King Minos or Minos. It depends on who you had as a teacher. I've heard it both ways from a professor. So I always learn Minos. I'll probably end up saying that most of the time, but Minos is okay as well. And it was a civilization that was forgotten until its rediscovery in the early 1900s, in fact, 1900. The early Minoans lived very lavishly for what we consider, you know, a very primitive time. And Knossos was certainly indicative of that. Flushing toilets, running water, it was a multi-leveled palace. And it wouldn't be until Sir Arthur Evans, a British archeologist, started digging there that things about Knossos started to be revealed. Okay, so first let's talk about that myth that's associated with the palace. Here's what it looks like today. Uh, it's a, as you can tell, you know, it's, it's a ruin, uh, but the local people had always associated this place with the story of the Minotaur. And many of you who don't know Greek mythology, let me tell you a little bit about the Minotaur. The Minotaur was a creature that was half man, half bull. And supposedly he was imprisoned beneath the palace of Knossos by Minos because he was the child of Minos's queen. So how did that happen? Wow, you know, that doesn't just happen. What happened was... Minos asked Poseidon, that's the head god for the Greeks, of course, they're, you know, an island kingdom, so the god of the sea, if he could borrow a bull. And so, and, and again, there's variations on this story, so if you've heard various stories, they're all out there. I'm just telling you the one that uh, was the one I learned and the one that is, this is a, you know, one of them. It's, there's other ones, so... Check it out for yourself. But here's what I know. Remember, it's a myth. Uh, Poseidon lent a magical bull to Minos, and Minos took the bull, and his cow herd became extremely prolific. His cows had many calves, and money 
in those days didn't really have that much substance. It was, you know, things like livestock and land and and grain and stuff like that. This is what gave you wealth. And so Minos was thrilled. But it was only for a year. And when the year ran up, he was supposed to bring the bull back to Poseidon. Poseidon came for it and Minos decided, I'm not returning it. So he hid it. And he hid it in a cave on Crete. Crete is very mountainous. Now, you can't hide something from a god, right? So Poseidon knew, and he put a curse on Minos, that when his wife saw the bull, she would fall madly in love with it. So Minos hid it. He didn't tell his wife. He knew about the curse, but you know what happened. She found it anyway. She went looking for what he was hiding. And when she saw the bill, bull, excuse me, she fell, she fell madly in love with it and they had a child. And it was the Minotaur. M-I-N-O-T-A-U-R. Okay? It was a mad creature that only ate human flesh. And so Minos imprisoned it below the palace and from the mainland six young men and six young women had to be sacrificed every year so the bull would be happy. And it was a horrific creature. It wouldn't be until one of those young men, Theseus was his name, convinced Minos's daughter to help him that the bull was finally, the Minotaur was finally slain. And Theseus got her. She fell in love with him, the princess, and she held a ball, ball of twine so he could unroll it in that maze underneath Knossos because the word labyrinth comes from this story. It was a labyrinth underneath the palace. And so that way he could kill the bull and find his way out. And that's what happened. So that's a story that's associated with Knossos on Crete again. The Minoans, though, had such a lavish lifestyle. We know so little about it because, as I said in the beginning, we can't read their writing. They had writing, we just can't read it. But we can take guesses from looking at art, and that's where art comes in great. It's a non-written part of history. So if you can see here in this recreation of what people think uh, the palace looked like, you'll see it's multi-leveled, and you see the image of the bull, and you see something happening here, and we believe they practiced this. Uh, either it's a dance, or perhaps it's the forerunner of the bullfight in a, you know, celebrations with the bull at the center. The palace was beautifully decorated with artwork, especially work um, having to do with the ocean. You can see here with the porpoises. It's beautiful. I've been there. Uh, I'll tell you what, I always tell people about Crete, my students, it's one of the hottest places I've ever been on the planet. Crete is hot. I've been to the outback. I've been Charleston, South Carolina, that ranks way up there, and Crete. It was blistering that day. We were there in the summertime. We were in Greece for a month, and we went to Crete. We took a ferry over there, and it was amazing to be here, because this is what they believe the old throne room was in Knossos. And you can see here the beautiful fresco work that the Minoans were doing. Now, Evans has restored some of this. Some people question his restoration, especially here in the columns, but they appear to be the forerunners for later Greek columns, the Doric order. And, and this is speculation, all right? But notice the motif of the bull. The bull does appear again and again and again. He does. He's always present in Minoan culture. The bull the sea. You see here that beautiful, beautiful, it's a, uh, it's actually a, excuse me, <coughs> fresco. You can see here that it's chipped off the wall a little bit, but look at how beautiful with the fish and the porpoises. I mean, it is a truly, and this is still there. You can go there and see this stuff. They were also well known for doing this beautiful pottery. You see the flying fish up here? I would love to own a piece of this. And these are in the museum. You can go and see the museum. And one of the most famous pieces is this vase with the big squid or octopus on it. Minoans were wealthy and they had tons of contact with Egypt. We know that. 
and they also traded uh, into Asia Minor. And so we see here a big influence from Egypt on the Minoans, especially in the stance of the figures. Egyptian art, if you remember that lecture, we see the profile view of the figure, the human body. And we see that here as well in Minoan art. Difference being color. Whereas the Egyptians celebrated death and they had a cult of death, it seemed the Minoans were fascinated by life and the joy found therein. Uh, the figure in profile here, the torso from the front, and then of course from the waist down, the lower half of the body in profile. They did things like fishing and they had celebrations it appeared they had many different types of people in Minoan culture. Uh, it would have been a place that was multicultural. Look at its position. I showed you the island. It's in between Africa, Asia, and Europe. So it's in a perfect spot. So we see these variations in the art. And also, just look at the tracings of, we know that they're trading this stuff. And again, they were great sea traders. All right, now what happened to them? Well, that's another story. But again, their legacy is this love of bulls, the cultural things, the love of the sea. You see here a bull again. Um, let me go back to this one. They appeared to celebrate something with the bull. Perhaps it was a rite of spring. Perhaps again, this is where bullfighting begins. But it looks like a dance almost where the, he's being you know, propelled over the top of the bull. But again, we are unclear of this. All right, but we do know that they spread their culture out to satellite cultures. These are some images I just wanted to share with you. This is an image I took there that day. It was so hot. Um, the film I was using, it's a special effects film. You can see it's almost like radiating the heat. When I touched this handrail, I burned my hand. It was about a hundred and that day out on the top of the plateau. We got there as soon as it opened at 8 a.m. And it reached 107 before, before noon because we left by then. But their satellite colonies, one of the most important one, was here on the ancient island of Thera. And that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to look at Akrotiri. I just want to show you how influential these people were. Uh, the Thera today is called Santorini. Okay, it's right there from Crete. You see it? And again, we took a ferry over there. It wasn't a very long ride. I think it was a couple hours we went over there. And Santorini seemed to have been one of their main outposts. Or in other words, colony. All right, but what happened at Santorini leads to an interesting story. And you'll, you'll understand, some of you will, when I start to tell you about it. Santorini is volcanic. A lot of this area is indeed volcanic. And you can see here they had a massive, massive eruption in about 3000 BCE, somewhere in there. All right, what happens is the volcano in the center of the island, so it's like in this lagoon, explodes. And when it does, the whole entire island is the middle is blown out in fact the hole is so deep that's left there that today when cruise ships go there they can't anchor it's a 6,000 foot depth there but what is so interesting is we don't know what happened to the people we believe the speculation is they knew that this was going to happen and they left and you see here this artist reproduction of them leaving on ships. But they did abandon their homes. Now that is where the volcano was. This is where we were staying. This is our the edge of our hotel room. So you can imagine with a volcanic eruption on this tiny island, I'm looking down into where the old volcano was. It was devastating with all the ash. And the Egyptians saw it and they reported it. And they report it was a darkness for seven days. So the ash was that thick that it obliterated the sun. So what happened to these people? 
I mean, the island today, you can still see the remnants of the volcanic eruption. It's definitely affected by it for its entire history. And Akrotiri, that town of about 20,000 people, was covered in ash, only to be rediscovered in, 19, in the 1960s. Okay, uh, when we go there, oops, sorry, I just hit the camera, sorry about that. Uh, and they begin to dig. They find this incredibly complex city filled with artifacts that just were abandoned. And you can walk down the street and see where the people of Akrotiri lived. The walls were covered with beautiful frescoes, uh, images like here of antelope, and beautiful, beautiful depictions of nature. What happened to them? Well, Homer, who wrote the story that dealt with this ancient culture, said that it disappeared into the sea. And the people developed a far superior culture that continued to flourish as they adapted to living underwater. I hope you guys know the myth. It's called Atlantis. And so this is where the story comes from. But these are the people who had a great influence on the development of Greek culture on the mainland. And at about 600 BCE, we start to see what happens on the mainland. Uh, glim glimpses of what would become the foundations of Greek culture. Now, what really happened to the people of you know, Santorini and Crete is we believe that that explosion caused a huge tsunami. And so anyone escaping on a ship would have been drowned because they think that that tsunami would have been, I've seen the speculations by scholars, three times the height of the Empire State Building. And they've actually documented waves reaching inland at Crete seven miles. They've found remnants of sea life and things like that. So that would have destroyed everything and and the Minoans kind of died out but they still had an influence in Greece in about 600 BCE we start to see the emergence of early Greek culture in the period called archaic Greece archaic the word means old okay and we start to see here on the mainland especially around Athens all right so there's Athens there's Crete there's ancient Thera okay and that's where we're at this is today would be Turkey. Uh, we see the emergence of the archaic Greeks and they begin to show human figures. So this is what's really different about the Greeks. The Egyptians were interested in the ideas of the gods and the power of the Pharaoh, but the Greeks are interested in humans. They would develop a philosophy known as humanism. Man is the measure of all things. And so for the first time, we see natural depictions of human figures here in their pottery. Black figure, obviously, because it's black. And red figure pottery. This doesn't mean they went right into having natural-looking statues. Look at the influence of Egypt here. And, of course, Manoa. No. These early statues were very stiff still. But notice the difference here. First of all, they're not engaged to a block. Second, they're nude. Third, they're life-size. Okay, so we're the Egyptian ones. But also, they're not of a particular person. Greek art is idealized. It's not a human, a specific human. It's what a perfect human would have looked like. And in these Koro statues, these are called votive statues, we see young men shown who are quite you know, beautiful, if you will. Koro statues were used for, votive statues, I should say, in general, were used in graveyards. So the commemoration of somebody who had passed away. Now, the Koro statues had a female um, counterpoint, the Kore. And these are the females. Notice they are clothed, though. And also notice this little tiny smile on their mouth. You see it. It's called the archaic smile. And so these are important precedents for the beginning of the study of individuals. Koros and Kore work began to show the Greek interest in the body. 
It will not, though, certainly be until the end of the archaic period we start to see anything that looks naturalistic. I do want to point out one particular work to you. It's called the Calf Bear because it will have a huge impact on early Christian art. Uh, this is Hermes, the messenger of the gods, and he's also shown as being the uh, God who uh, guided souls to hell. All right, but he's depicted as this figure with the calf on his shoulders, and the calf bear becomes where we get the image of Christ with the lamb. Okay, so it's got a big influence, so don't forget it. But it wouldn't be till the end of the archaic period that we start to see the Greek understanding of the body emerge and here we have Kritios boy. Kritios boy is showing something we've not seen before and that is contrapposto, an Italian word, C-O-N-T-R-A-P-P-O-S-T-O. The observation of the S curve of the body, you can see it here from the rear of, oops, sorry about that, the rear of Critios boy. The hip gets pushed up on the straight leg and this is how we truly stand. We do not stand stiff-legged like we saw in the Egyptian works or the Mesopotamian works or the Minoan works. We lean on one hip or the other. So it's super important. It's a Greek innovation. Don't forget it. It'll have an impact on the Renaissance.